Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to a new season of the 42 Rugby Weekly. I hope your summer, however dystopian, was a blast. If you're back in school, hopefully the new year has started well for you. If you're about to head back to college or indeed about to head along in person for the first time, may you have maybe you have a real life freshers week coming up. Make the most of it. And if you're back in the office or your place of work or just still plowing away generally, I hope you're happy and well. I hope as well that we can once more become a fixture in your Thursday plans because rugby with fans is back. We'll look ahead to the men's season and the inaugural URC season this day next week. But today we're going to get stuck into the recent goings on in the women's game. Let's be honest, it's been a troubling few days on the back of a great Interpro series. And joining me to discuss it all are the two OGs. Murray Kinsella of the 42 and former Ireland international Bernard Jackman. Murray, people who don't have the fortune to know you as well as I do may not be aware of the extent to which you go off grid when you take some <laughs> well-earned time off. So when I'm asking you, how was your summer? What did you get up to? This is the first time I'll actually be hearing these answers. Uh, how much rugby were you able to squeeze past your wife, Jen, for example, over the last few weeks? Uh, a few bits of the rugby championship, Bledisloe Cup. Um, watching that obviously out of interest, always interesting, but did definitely get away from it, it all. Um, I was over in Spain for my version of a freshers week, I suppose, and was in Donegal, some beautiful scenery, swimming in the sea, and then finish up with a little visit to Galway last week, which was unbelievable. I, I hadn't been there for a few years. I'd forgotten how much crack it was, how much life the city has, unreal food, pints are just incredible if you like your Guinness. Um, so I'm very well refreshed and very excited to get stuck back into it all, Gav. Back on the horse birch, which is my pathetic way of saging to your own summer activities. Uh, tell us about your <laughs> recent investment. How are you getting on? No, look at it. Uh, I'm involved in a, in a racing syndicate with a friend of mine um, in the Jessica Harrington train. So I was in Galway, Ballon Robe. Um, where else was I? I was, uh, I think it was in Ross Common. So we, um, but we got a we got a win anyway. Uh, we got a win. Exit pole is the name of the horse, and uh, yeah, it was a great great excitement. And I think we're going to Ross Common again Monday week. So um, the, the pro for, URC starting back, but also um, a bit of uh, national hunt racing as well to to keep me occupied. So all good. Great fun. Great fun. Hard to get a winner. I'm delighted to get one. Never a dull moment. Your summer generally has been okay, has it? Yeah, it's been good. It's been good. Um, back to her back, coaching there. Um, loving it, yeah. Uh, league starts on Saturday. So, and, um, yeah, it's just great to see, see see the lads being able to play. We Like, at certain times during COVID, we were allowed to train um, in pods of, of 15, um, but we couldn't play games. And, uh, yeah, while we still don't have dressing rooms or showers, just being able to play some games um, has been, been brilliant, you know. Magic. How have you been, Gav? We never asked you. To be honest, absolutely great, but nothing has changed for me in the last few weeks. I've just been working away. I took a break earlier in the summer when you hung me out to dry on a previous pod where I was down on the piss and carry for a week <laughs> <Sorry>. or so. <laughs> so. So nothing to really write home about over the last few weeks. Just been keeping the head down, plowing away. I was in Leeds for Katie Taylor's fight recently, which was good. First time getting out of the country in... 18 months to two years, I guess. And look, part of me wishes she was fighting in New York or somewhere. I kind of said like, Jesus, could you yeah. not have gone to <laughs> Leeds is a beautiful town, rugby league town now, but beautiful town. We're in Headingley actually, which was the, the stadium for the fight. So yeah, good. Thanks, Mer. Come here, as I good. said at the top, we we'll focus on the women's stuff this week and we'll get into like the wider issues and some of the off the field goings on over recent days in a while, but we should start with the game. Uh, and that defeat to Spain, which on the face of it, and I think however you spin it, was just disastrous and, and shocking, really, uh, performance-wise and in terms of probably our expectations of a result as Ireland look to qualify for the Rugby World Cup. So starting with yourself, Murray, where exactly did it go wrong? How was it so bad to your mind? Quite a few areas they could have picked out in the review and will have picked out. Um Three that stood out to me, probably the discipline. They conceded 15 penalties and they definitely would argue with some of those decisions and, and the refereeing, but that's a huge number in a big test match. It was really costly. A lot of them were in attack when they were in good positions, stuff around the breakdown, uh, getting isolated ball carriers a, a number of times. You saw that where maybe just a little bit of 
cohesion and organization wasn't there. They obviously had handling errors, I think five or six of them in the end. There was a rustiness given the lack of, of game time and the line out was a disaster really. They lost seven on their own throw. I think three crooked throws as well as Spain obviously defending very well to their credit. They did really make life difficult for Ireland there and, and at the scrum also. But the big one that stood out to me, and I went back through it last night just to, to get the stats on it. Ireland had 11 visits into Spain's 22 and they scored obviously just once. Like that's disastrous return on an unbelievable amount of strong position and good position. Again, a number of those were probably a little bit unlucky. They had a five meter mall chance where the, the penalty decision went against them, could have gone completely the other way. But they had a number of opportunities, obviously, to potentially kick points. I think once in particular underneath the posts where they opted to tap against 14 players, maybe a chance to scrum against 14 players with Spain having one in the bin and use that numerical advantage and they got held up. But there are a whole litany of their own errors playing into that as well. 11 visits is is huge number and you've got to get return on that. It's a game they should have had wrapped up by halftime if we're being realistic about it. Even beyond the, the bits where they were camped five metres out, they had a chance down the left-hand side where they had a three on, on two, three on one maybe even, and, and the ball didn't go early enough into Baven Parsons' hands. We saw what she could do. Um, and also we saw what Amy Lee Murphy Crow can do whenever she got on the ball, but that probably didn't happen enough. And as they saw those opportunities slip, I do think in the second half there was that element of panic and stress caused by this not perfectly going their way, not closing out the game. And even though Spain, uh, like again, I probably overrated their performance watching it first time, haven't had reviewed it, you know, they made a lot of errors, gave Ireland a lot of opportunities, but they just managed to cling in there and they got that chance. They quick tapped from another really poor Ireland penalty and Ireland were slow to react, having probably been lucky to avoid a penalty try just before that. So yeah, it was, as you say, a disastrous start to this competition and leaves them with a real uphill battle now, Italy to come on Sunday. That's going to be a really difficult fixture given how impressive they were against Scotland in a six try win. So tough times for, for Ireland at the moment. Certainly was. And Bernard, it's only fair, obviously, to put the spotlight on some of the players. And as Murray has discussed there, a litany of unforced errors, people not really doing their jobs within this, within the context of this match. At the same time, this team has had these qualifiers in their line of sight for months. I know, in fairness, there was no concrete date for a long time, but they have actually been working towards it collectively for months. So on the coaching side of things as well, questions to be asked. And I suppose the first one is, where did it go wrong from that point of view, from Adam Griggs's point of view? Well, look, the, the players looked undercooked. Um, and I think we have to ask, was it wise to pull them out of the Interpros? Could they have not have played an Interpro series um, and then, you know, go to go to that World Cup qualifier? Um, I think selection, two new caps for a, a big game. Did they underestimate Spain? Um, still not. Still, we haven't found a 10. I think we've used... You know, in double figures, uh, uh, potentially eleven or twelve different different tens um, since um, since Adam Griggs came in, which is um, which is worrying. Um, and I, I just, yeah, this team looked completely undercooked. Um, so I, I think that I don't know what, the, like, in fairness, they've been putting in a huge amount of time in camp, um, but that's kind of collective understanding of how they want to attack um that accuracy just wasn't there and it was a, a very very tepid performance and we need to call it as it, as it was it was a really really poor performance and you know the question i suppose you asked me was you know around coaching i think that yeah i think the mistakes be made now in fairness i would go deeper as well in terms of I, and I, I, you know, I believe that the only way Ireland can be have success, um, sustainable success at women's level, is is a strong domestic game. It's not a professional game. We need to have schools, clubs, uh, vibrant, um, producing more players. And if you look at Inter Pros, I thought it was brilliant and fair play to T, um, Tina G for for uh, televising it. Uh, but the age profile of of a lot of the teams was was quite high. So, um. I would be worried that there's not this next generation coming through. And, and when you look at the club game um, and how how probably dominant dominated it is by a couple of clubs um, and how in certain certain provinces, actually senior clubs have disappeared, that's the fear for me. And, and that affects 
the the top end, you know, quite quickly. So the top end, what we see against Spain is is the um, is the roof on the on the house, you know. Um, and the coaches have a, have a role to play in terms of you know making sure that they give those players a good game plan. The skill set is 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 adequate, etc. Which it wasn't. The skill set was very poor. But if there's not a, an increase or um, yeah a vibrant level underneath where those players come from. I think it's going to be very difficult, and I think that's been. I mean, you know, there hasn't been great strides made in Irish women's rugby. I, I think we're gone. We're gone back. Um, you know, we went from third in the World Cup to hosting a World Cup to to now, you know, f- crossing our fingers and hope we qualify for one. Um, and we probably got away with the fact that okay, when we play France and England, it gets exposed. Uh, but because we've been able to beat poor Scotland teams, poor Welsh teams, and an Italian team in fairness who are capable, um, but we've been able to beat them. Uh, we've kind of we've felt okay about it, and and for certain, I, I certainly think there are if you felt okay about it, and they just bury their heads and hope, you know, it'll all go away until the next time we have to play England or France, and there'll be a bit of a backlash, and the whole professionalism will will come up again, and they'll brush that off because they'll say there's not the, enough money for it, and it just goes from year to year with it, with not really understanding that there's a problem, and um, there is a big problem, and and uh, yeah, I I just think that. I think that the the dressing room incident, you know, uh, this week is a is a is a shambolic um, uh, example of of the I suppose the operational side of things. But it's it's the core of it is that there's not enough time. And forget about these hashtags and press campaigns and PR stunts. They are they, they might get two or three percent of people into a club um, or, or or playing rugby or into a stadium, but. The reality is, um, and I said this I said this in February when when uh, um, when uh, the RFU disagreed with me about it. But like you know, Mary Jackman in Tullow wants to play rugby. She's not going to go into the RFU website and read a strategic plan. Okay, she, that, 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 the amount of people who will do that, they're going to go out to Tullow Rugby Club. They're going to look over the fence and to see um, some some girls or women training. You know, and it's a safe environment and there's a competition structure and there's good feedback from the the parents and the players. They they'll join. That that's it. So it's 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 in the communities. It's it's these hashtags. Uh, it, um, I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with them, but it, that can't be your way of promoting uh, women's rugby. That can't be your way of governing um, and and trying to create a vibrant club game. Is just a PR campaign, in, in my opinion. There has to be there has to be more than that. And and it seems as if the ten, you know they've extended the the All Ireland League. They've added two teams by invitation. Obviously, you know, COVID is a brilliant excuse, but let's be honest, people have got on with their lives and jobs in COVID, okay? They found ways to to continue to try and evolve and get better. And, you know, it seems as if that the clubs, you know, have asked for engagement, asked for representation on the RFU committee, um, which the, IRFU, the AIA clubs don't have any representation on the RFU committee. And, you know, if, if, if what's out there is, is correct, there's been no response for for ten or eleven months, um, you know, which is which is worrying, you know, uh, worrying about where their the real where their hunger is to to make it better. So, look at this. Hopefully, this is it's a horrendous to have to maybe miss out in a World Cup or, you know, have to lose to Spain to reach rock bottom, and horrendous that you know those kind of players had to had to change where they did. Um, but if if it's the point where we said. We have reached rock bottom, and change happens. Well, then it'll be worth it um, in a, in a sadistic way. But if it if it isn't, if if change doesn't happen, this is something that's okay. They won't be getting changed beside rats again. But I don't see any real uh, huge development of uh, uh, in terms of participation, in terms of vibrancy in the in the women's game because sevens is only for a certain amount. Um, of 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 players, and you know, and fifteens is probably where we've the most likely chance of of having some success and, and competing. Uh, but also in terms of making it more open to to uh to the masses, and we seem to have taken our eye off that uh, in my in my opinion. And um, we're trying to basically chase two two carrots when underneath there's not enough to to do one well. Murray, come in there. Yeah, there's so much in that. Um, firstly, on the, the immediate task at hand for the national team, I think missing out on a World Cup would be really damaging. Birch is talking about a young player 
looking over the fence and seeing local players getting on and enjoying the rugby it's really important to have an aspirational element to that as well where you're looking at successful or even mildly successful teams and you want to be part of that and we've had some of that recently like young players like Baven Parsons Dorothy Wall they're like kind of role models we've discussed that before being there at a World Cup is absolutely pivotal and Ireland have been part of what the previous seven they missed the first one all the way back in 1991 but they've been there since they hosted the most recent one obviously it didn't go well but to dr drop away from that would be really damaging they still have obviously a, a, a chance of doing this even in this tournament if they finish second they get another qualification repetage tournament against who is it Samoa Colombia and an Asian team which they'd expect to win but they even have a, a job in their hands to get that second place because Italy are going to be really tough as we said this weekend and then underneath that, absolutely, like it was so dispiriting um, to just see another episode of, I suppose, scandal, disgrace, another fiasco in Irish women's rugby. It seems that it just lurches from one to the other, all the way back to what, 2012, the national team traveling to Poe over what, 17 or 18 hours was it at the time? And and they got a couple of hours kept in their hotel before they, they played a match and, and lost. And you go from that to advertising a part-time head coach role when everyone else is moving in the opposite direction. There's a host of, of different incidents there that you can look at and highlight and say, there's just not enough care of duty there from, from the authorities, the RFU, IRFU in, in this case. So yeah, it is definitely in a frustrating position. And even the national team, they have gone backwards when, when others have accelerated and moved on to professionalism without even that being the answer here um, it is worrying to see Ireland being left behind by those teams and absolutely the vibrancy of the club game is is really important and that's another issue that's been simmering away underneath like so much goes on in Irish women's rugby that we don't hear about probably don't hear about enough um, and the club's game is, is part of that like, there's been frustration that we've mentioned before from the clubs about how the whole scene is organized and governed and how they don't have enough of a decision making say in, in everything that happens and that in fact they're ignored at times by the RFU they feel so it really isn't in a healthy state and yeah they may get into a world cup but does that paper over the cracks in a way like this does feel like a bit of a turning point and it's really been interesting to read and listen and ponder the comparisons with the FAI and, and the Irish um, women's football team and their kind of stand in Liberty Hall in 2017 when enough had been enough and how male players have probably helped that process that they're going through now. Um, actually, Mary Hannigan had a brilliant piece in the Irish Times today saying that now they got to get those results on the pitch after the, the progress off it. But it's, it's hard not to see that this is a point where people say enough is enough um, and then there's probably a bit more outspokenness. Even the Connacht players kind of belatedly, I suppose, making a statement and putting their voice out there was really welcome because that's the kind of stuff that does force a bit of change, that makes people a lot more uncomfortable um, because it's easy for the RFU to dismiss us and tell us we're talking shite on a podcast, but when players themselves and, and fans themselves are really making their voices heard, that makes a big difference. I think I, is, well, I, I think sorry yeah, sorry Gav I, I think we have to as 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 pundits or, or people who are passionate about it we have to probably take some a stronger role too um I think it's very hard for for a player um and I admire them massively for for the ones who have have spoke out but I just think it's very hard for them given that there's the fear of their career um and that's uh, you know that, that's a it's a, it takes a very strong um person to come out and criticize the the, the governing body so I, I think it's 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 basically our us who who are close close ish to it um uh to to be strong on it and for the fans um to to row in behind it and the people in the clubs i mean the reality is i know that there's a you know there's a, the the perception from the clubs is that there's a poor relationship but they still do provide the players you know and the players will always go to the union because that's where you know, to play for your country is the is the ultimate honor. But um, you can't abuse that for for the longer you, the more you abuse that right. Um, you know, the more disenfranchised people get. And yeah, I, I I think that it's been coming down the track. And as I said, you know, sometimes you get away with it. You get a result, and 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 it's you know you beat France, you beat Spain, you know, narrowly, and and you qualify. 
and you know there's not a spotlight on it but if you go back to you know the the strategic plan you know and, and the performance measurables that that our, the RFU have said they're they're chasing and how they want to be judged on I mean, you know, I'm going to read them here. World Cup qualification 2021 and top six finish. We still may qualify. Um, I wouldn't say, you know, we're odds on to be top six finish, but that's that's still to be achieved. One women, six nations, no. Qualification for 2020 Olympic sevens, no. Qualification for 2027's Rugby World Cup, no. Win two sevens World Series tournaments, no. Consistent top six finishes World Seven Series, no. Consistent top two finishes Rugby Europe under 18s, No. So like these, and I know that David Nusifor came out and said when he was asked in his last um, briefing about the, the KPIs, and he said, "Look, they don't really hold much uh, value on those." But again, as 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 a rugby person, you know, if that's what the Bible is, and that's what they're chasing, and that's what they're going to measure themselves against, I mean, we're miles off. We're like we're we're, we're miles off any of them. And again, as I said, it's very much spread over sevens and and fifteens, and on both counts, we're. We're nowhere near it, and it's not just Adam Griggs. Uh, it's it's effectively the the whole game um, needs a, a major <laughs> revamp, but not a look at this um, investigation or tribunals and stuff like that's sometimes that's kicking the touch, you know, um, and it'll all die down. Like realistically, you know, are they going to implement what they said they're going to do, um, and is that the right policy? And I, I, like I'm not an expert on it, I, you know. There's people in the club game. Um, uh, in the domestic game, who know more about it than I do, but like not to be engaging with them in a very meaningful, you know, uh, way. I, I find it hard to understand how people who aren't involved in that know the best way forward and think they can do it without bringing people with them. Um, just for me, it doesn't make sense. And and you know, I, I think that I think that needs to be it needs to be a, a crisis point, which I think we've reached, um, and a, and a solution needs to come from this. Mur, the media certainly has a role in this, as do fans, as Bernard says. And as you were saying a moment ago, male players, a big part of this, a big part to play in this, need to hear more from them. And I thought it was good that Gary Ringrose, Paul Boyle were asked about it and spoke about it um, in fairly certain terms yesterday at the launch of the URC. <sighs> Don't wait to be asked about it, though. You know, this is your sport. Like, show some interest in the health of it. And I admittedly didn't hear uh, Johnny Sexton's interview and off the ball. I saw a quote from it where he said, like, I hope when my daughters are playing or if my daughters are playing rugby that they get treated the same way I did. That's not really good enough, to be totally honest. And, like, I, I know where he's coming from, but forget about your daughters. Like, there are players playing rugby, women, girls, right now. And if you want it to be different down the line, then you should want to be, it to be different now. At the same time then, right, while male players absolutely do have a role to play in this and the direct comparison with the women's soccer team is fairly pertinent here as well because the likes of Seamus Coleman were heavily involved in, say, the women's national team getting equal match fees and so on recently. Uh, and as difficult as it is for, say, somebody like Kira Griffin or a leader in that team to actually speak out against the IRFU, we understand the difficulty of that. Nothing worth having is easily gotten really and there is a bit of a bigger picture the idea that somebody who speaks out against the IRFU is going to become an, a sacrificial lamb I think is a little bit of a fallacy I could be totally wrong now but if you spoke out uh, it's well, not okay, speaking Gav, out against Gav. them so much but if you spoke in sorry Gav I mean sorry about yeah. Yeah. you know just just I want to pull you up on that I mean if they try and control the message of people who don't work for them or um, you know how how likely is it that they won't be unimpressed with somebody in, who's who's basically a, a volunteer or um, you know who's who's an, uh, yeah a volunteer or a player who plays for them? I, I think it's very hard for a, a, a player to speak out. Even I think it's very hard. But but no, like, no, but a, fe a female player. Could, could yeah. I just say though, Murray? Like for I, I completely agree with Bernard. They would be unimpressed. There'd be a bollocking dished out, almost certainly. But in terms of careers being at stake, I think when you have massive public support behind you, that changes things. And we've seen that this week with the constant apologies and the so-called investigation and so on. Now, of course, some of that is lip service or kicking it to touch, as Birch says. But if somebody speaks out and says, listen, this, some of these some of this crowd needs to kick up the hole or whatever, like, or speaks out in favour of the health of their sport, 
people will ruin behind them. And it's a dangerous thing then to ostracize them or whatever, which has been suggested. I, I don't see that personally as being a possibility. Yeah, it's, it, it, is, it is a tough personal thing for people. And like Louise Lawless did some brilliant reporting on it this week about how players had been basically told to shut up and, and not do interviews and speak about it. Um, and like from my experience, that is a, maybe not to that uh, overbearing degree, but you, you speak to female players all the time and they've got issues or they've, they kind of hint at, allude to things, but don't quite go there and tell you the full story and certainly not on the record in, in any sense. So I think there's a lot more stories that we don't know about in behind the scenes about players feeling like they were maybe marginalized from squads uh, for different reasons. I think there's there's plenty of stuff like that that may come to light if, if people do start speaking a little bit more. From the men's point of view, like I don't think there's any danger in them supporting or speaking in, in support of, of women's rugby. Like they're really strong positions. Some of the players in particular, like Johnny Sexton is a great example. Like without players like that, you don't have a, a team. They're the people who drive professional rugby in, in the con in the country. Um, and they're the ones who have a really powerful voice. Absolutely, you're, you're bang on, Birch. Like it's really important that the media stays on top of this, but players are who people really listen to and really respect as well. And, and they can have a, a, a big say in it. So yeah, it, it, it's great to have the players, a couple of asked this week, answered honestly and showed their support. Um, but they probably need to be part of the process as well. And from the, from the female point of view, I can totally understand the, the personal difficulty of it and fearing for your place on a team, but you're giving so much to a cause that you're not getting paid for your, driving around the country, you're going to training sessions, you're sacrificing, you're taking annual leave to, to go and play for your country. And it just gets to a breaking point that Birch has kind of mentioned there. And when it, when is enough enough? Like, Yeah, just sorry to clarify, Gav, <laughs> I took you up wrong. Um, I, I, I meant it was harder for a, a, a women's player in the group to come out. I, I, I don't see there being repercussions, uh, fatal repercussions for a man, a men's player who, who came out to support them. Uh, yeah, I just, you know, I think they have enough I, I, credibility I, I'm, and standing. <clears throat> I'm talking about a female player. Okay. Like, yeah, Liberty Hall is a great example. I think it's hard, Gav. Yeah. No, I, I completely acknowledge it's hard. I completely acknowledge it's hard. And there is obviously a chance that, yes, you could be pushed aside or excluded from squads. But think about how that looks optically, Birch, and think about how obsessed the IRFU are with optics. Like it's kind of square peg and round hole territory for them if you exclude a player in this type of climate, socially or sociologically, having spoken out against you. And like there's ways of speaking out against, like we're not talking about an employer-employee relationship in most cases here either, you know. We're yeah. talking about a governing body that could be doing better as we've been discussing for half an hour. Yeah, like I, I look at I, I don't. I'm sure there's there's grumbling and 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 valid um, reasons of unhappiness among amongst the national team, right? But uh, I still probably think that it probably hasn't reached a bad enough point for them in terms of facilities. They've good facilities in Abbottstown, kit, travel, medical, etc. I'd say a lot of that stuff is actually adequate, to be honest. Um, uh, again, and it's very hard for one of those players who who have had better treatment over the last five years than their predecessors, for example, um, to probably criticise internally. But the reality is, you know, when you're a player, you don't understand the the importance of governance at a lower level. You don't understand the importance of coach education at a lower. Like it's very hard. I mean, like a lot of players are so immersed in trying to be the best possible version of themselves as a player. They actually don't want to know about a lot of the, the politics uh, behind it. So, you know, from that point of view, I think it's probably not like the FAI where, you know, they had to get changed in the airport and give back track suits. I, I hope, I, I actually, I hope to God it's not like that. Uh, and if it is, I think they should, you know, they should be um, making that known. I, I doubt it is, to be honest. But my big criticism is, is what happened below that. What happened, you know, in, in Donnybrook. What's, what's happening, you know, uh, at lower levels. That's where... I think, you know, real change needs to happen. Um, and until that change happens, you know, you might have a brilliant coach who can get the absolute maximum out of a group of players, or you might have another, you know, another Baven Parsons or Dirty Wall who help you, you know, beat Italy, Scotland, Wales. But you're going to get further, further away from France and England. And, and 
France and England is built on big domestic play numbers, you know. They obviously have a great coaching setup and all that stuff, but the game is ingrained in in every town and village in France. Um and there's a vibrant club game. Um and that's that's why they have so many players playing elite level. I know there's always a population issue for us, but you know, realistically you look at the numbers, you know, we haven't capitalized on a successful Irish team, you know, um back 15, 16 years ago. And um now we're on the verge of potentially missing out on a World Cup. We're not getting to the Olympics in sevens, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you know, we we are. It looks like we're going to struggle against England and France every year in the Six Nations for a while, um, and that's not a good image for for the for the young young girls who who are looking to play a game. It's a great point about players existing ostensibly in a bubble, Birch, and how. They might not be aware or might not want to be aware, as you say, of the things going on beneath you or beneath your level of the sport. But I guess, Murray, <laughs> now's the time to look into it. it. Like, because as we're saying, if you don't have that conveyor belt of talent going through, if you don't have the playing numbers, you're caught between a rock and a hard place and will be probably perpetually. And I guess the only solution, if Ireland are going to catch up with, say, the two bigger teams in the Six Nations, if they are going to, say, challenge for future World Cups, or even finishing a top six potentially, uh, just needing more players, need more talent. And well, well, just on that, I would, like the national team players are absolutely, completely aware of everything that's going on, and, and I would say there's some real anger amongst the players, obviously, about what happened, as there is in the, the wider community. And also, we should like underline and stress there are some really brilliant people working in girls and women's rugby in Ireland, giving their time to try and grow the game, to give it a try campaign has been a success and, and has brought lots of new girls to to rugby and and introduced them and given them an opportunity to play. Um, and I think people who are involved in that side of the game would definitely disagree and, and say, listen, we're actually getting players into the game, we're promoting um, the sport and, and getting people to really embrace it. But it's not all joined up, is it? Like we've just spoken about how the clubs feel in terms of the AIL and, and their, their part in that. Um, so yeah, it can definitely be a more cohesive system. I suppose we had the example of Adam Griggs not being able to name who was really running the ship overall uh, very recently as well. And and that just paints that picture of disconnectedness. Um, so there's, there's a whole lot in it. Another thing to highlight is like, just in terms of the Donnybrook um, fiasco, like for me, it's kind of scandalous that these teams weren't deemed elite. This is an Irish government, I suppose, issue and COVID regulations. And I understand that that's really important. But to me, those were elite athletes. They should have been able to use changing rooms. Um, Sport Ireland have kind of said that the use of changing rooms was for, for professional athletes. But uh, we know that women's rugby in Ireland isn't professional. These are the, the some of the best players in the country, obviously without the Ireland players, on national TV, playing a really high quality competition. It's elite sport to everyone who watched it. Um, so I think that was part of the issue as well. It doesn't in any way excuse, obviously, what happened. Like it should have just taken a glance at that area of the of the facilities to say, no, this isn't going to do. But it was just crazy to me that they weren't considered elite athletes. There needs to be a bit more respect there, I think, for the level that that they're playing at and everyone who watched it on TG Car it was brilliant coverage uh, and the rugby was excellent and it's just such a pity that we're not looking back at that we're just talking about another incident of disrespect really in, in women's rugby and, and that's a shame because every time you think there's a little step forward there there's something like this that pops up it's just too regular too frequent well, looking forward then, Birch, uh, like, how do you create or how do you join up thinking? Because as Murray rightly points out, of course, and I, maybe I sounded a little bit dismissive in what I was saying a minute ago, but like, of course, there are like dozens, hundreds of people across the country doing unbelievable work on ground floor for women's rugby, girls rugby. But how do you convert that into more national team players? And and like, in fairness, this might be a, an issue of time as well and having to actually wait until some of these girls grow up to become senior players but uh, I guess uh, how do you actually collaborate like uh, how does it work as a system yeah. uh, and in what way is it not working now well I, I think the competition I mean there's a um, 
there seems to be a lack of appreciation of the of the domestic competition in terms of visibility in terms of Irish women's senior coaches going to AIL games and um, to scout talent and and there's a, there's a perception that you know it doesn't matter what you do for your club it's what you do in 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 training camps or in in the seven so that's something that if that's your breeding ground for your players and obviously you know there's 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 a feeling that the players don't get sent back to play AIL very often so they get taken away from their club and that's a tricky one to manage um i understand that but i think there needs to be visibility from the the coaches involved with the national team um at games first of all and i think we just need to get that AIL structure right so um a lot of clubs have have started off now um some have gone and, and tried to have an adult women's team and then a, a, and obviously mini rugby and then others are, are starting off with the under sixes and then bringing in teams through and just, you know, e every year having more more girls in the club and underage systems with the hope that when they get to adulthood, they'll become an, an adult team and obviously hopefully be good enough to play, uh, to bring that club to the AIL. Um, uh, and so what they need to make make sure is that the, they, that AIL is... Um, is a very good competition in terms of um, a, a relative evenness of standard. So at the moment, you know, Blackrock, Belvedere, Railway, and um, and UL Bowes are probably the the four big teams. And um, you know, if if what I hear is cr true, a lot of those games will be, you know, that when they play other teams, it could be 50, 60 points. You know what I mean? So you got to try and narrow that gap to try and get enough talent into the other teams that it's a it's a uh, a more competitive competition because having a one-sided competition where um you know the top are too are too strong won't do anything for uh for those players confidence levels in terms of growing uh rugby in that area so it's a, it's a tricky one so i think they need to invest in, in in coach development coach education um but really in terms of each club um what they're doing at underage level to increase uh, participation, coach those girls properly to to bring them through, and then as I said, then it's by that stage, and this is this isn't a quick fix uh, because it hasn't started yet. But you'd like to hope in three or four years' time that that AIL competition has very good refereeing, very good fixture scheduling, you know, at the right time on the right pitches um, when people from the club can can support it, not clashing with with everything else or on a back pitch. Um, and they're the kind of things it sounds like so so simple uh, but they're the things that matter to people is is just good operational scheduling fixturing coaching refereeing um and dialogue uh, and um you know if something's not working you know that you can address it and make it better uh, because for me I, I i just think the way forward is is the the girls who are 12 and 13 now um that when they become adults there's a better structure for them to to go into. I think that's that's where we're at, to be honest. Murray, I suppose it's the fact that it sounds simple or a lot of that potential solution sounds simple is kind of an indictment in a way because you ask yourself, why is none of this happening at the moment? As Bert says, it hasn't really started yet, a lot of it. Uh, do you feel as though this week will be uh, kind of a catalyst towards it actually beginning or more work being done? Because we've spoken in the past as well about how many people are actually employed by the IRFU to work on the women's game. And some of them are doing a great job, don't get me wrong. But it's in case anybody's listening to us speaking about women's rugby for the first time or, or wouldn't generally tune into uh, coverage of women's rugby, it's not the case that this is absolute threadbare on the side of staff or anything like that um it should be the case that the infrastructure is in place to actually bring the game to a healthier place but it just doesn't seem to be moving is this the week when it starts moving yeah hopefully it's a week when things take a step forward and you can absolutely sense the rfu being awake to to this issue and it's been a broader conversation like the sad reality but the good reality and at the same time is that more people are talking about this than will have engaged with those interprovincial matches like that's just the reality of a, a scandalous issue so people are are kind of tuned into it yeah there are people working in the irish women's game but another part of it is having women in governance positions like you look at the rfu's targets for for the national team but they also have a target of having a 20 percent uh, female representation on on boards 
in clubs, in all those decision-making roles. And in fairness, there have been recent steps towards that. You saw Fiona Steed and Yvonne Comer going on to the RFU committee. That's a really positive step. People who've been heavily involved in the women's game, who understand it at every level, who obviously understand how a rugby works and can have a say in really push the important women's rugby agenda in, in a room full of men who obviously have their own backgrounds and, and many of them I would say are most are, are not in, in women's rugby or an understanding of it. So that's absolutely pivotal as well. You, you need female representation through all aspects of, of the RFU and that's been something they've been slow to do. They've set themselves that target. They'll say things have been delayed. They set up a women in leadership program and I think that started last year helping people to upskill themselves to be in those positions as well. Um, and that's all positive, but that needs to happen really steadily and, and improve over the next couple of seasons so that we end up with a, a much better representation at that level as well. Um, because they're the people who, who have sway and, and decide the, the direction of, of the union as a, as a whole. And the sense within rom women's rugby is that it has been an afterthought too often in, in, in the past, over the last number of decades. As I said, we can go back a whole long way with incidents like this. So absolutely, hopefully this, another high profile incident is a, a step along towards making it better. Obviously a, a horrible thing that as has been promised won't happen again, but it really needs to be acted upon words mean so much less in, in these instances. You know, the apology means so much less than what we saw in that video. The hashtag nothing like it campaign means so much less than what we saw in that video. So while all, all those things have, have good intention, those campaigns and absolutely there's practical elements to that on the ground, it's what you do rather than what you say. And, and that's what we need to, to see now. Yeah, the hashtag turned out to be pretty accurate in a warped sense. Back on the pitch, Birch, this weekend, Italy, they're going to smell blood. Obviously, Ireland beat them in the Six Nations and did pretty well against them. Um, how difficult will it be for, say, Kira Griffin, for Griggs to park the Spain result when you're preparing for a game of this magnitude now this weekend? Because on the one hand, you can kind of use it as naturally motivation in the sense that you underperformed. On the other hand, though, if, st if things start to go wrong early in that game against Italy the way they did against Spain a few decisions even start going against you that can become almost a compound issue pretty quickly so uh, how separate is this Italy game to what just went before? I think um, it'll be a real test of how deep um, uh, and strong our self the, the, the player's self-belief is I mean you know the confidence will be will be battered by the Spain uh, result and performance. But if they really believe they're on the right track, if they really believe that um, they prepared well for for this competition, if they believe in the game plan, I think you know they'll be able to go out and, and bounce back. Because I don't think it was a case of not trying or or lack of um, enthusiasm. It was just literally everything that could go or nearly everything that could go wrong went wrong um, on the day, and maybe they're just a, a little a match shy, but. If there's doubts around that um, and, you know, the skill level, like I, I think the skill level is better than we saw against Spain. Um, it certainly was better at times in the Six Nations. So, um, you know, I would expect a, 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 a better performance because we've played a game and obviously um, I think we're better than, than, we, than we looked for sure. Um, on the other side of the coin, Italy are a very dangerous opposition. I know we we handled them um, well in the Six Nations, but when when you look back at that game, I mean, Italy Italy are very um, ambitious ball in hand, and they throw a lot of offloads in contact. And effectively against us, pretty much every one they threw, um, you know, didn't go to hand, and, and we had a lot of turnovers and and cost us. But against Scotland, those passes stuck. And you know they they will get a lot of um, momentum from that. So it's it's polar opposites going into this. Obviously, it's a home game for the Italians. Um, you know they probably went into this competition thinking we're playing for second, and you know uh, qualification due to repechage. Now they have a chance of, of of knocking us effectively out of it. So um, I think it's a huge test. And I think the problem again I have, and I said at the start was um, selection wise, not having a, a recognised ten who can. Who can manage the game um, and you know nurse the forwards into it? I think there's a doubt around our, our, our scrum. I, I can't understand how Chloe Pierce 
isn't over there. You know, she was man of the match uh, for Munster um, last weekend. Uh, I know she's maybe not the finished article as a scrummager, but even as an impact player, as a back row off the bench, I mean, that's what we need. We need players who can give us that go forward. And if we have to be direct against against Italy to get the win, well, that's what we have to do. You know, um, there's no harm in actually limiting a little bit our ambition uh, just to get the job done and have a World Cup. I mean, that's how that's how important it is. That kind of evolving game plan is important, you know, at certain times of the year as you develop. But now we've got ourselves in a situation where we're effectively 80 minutes away from being knocked out of a World Cup. So I think we have to we have to have a game plan that's um, very much tailored towards taking away the Italian strengths and, and playing into ours. So I look at, I, I, we can definitely win, for sure. I mean, Italy aren't the finished article. It's a massive gulf. But they are dangerous. They are dangerous and they will have their, their tails up. So um, I think it's going to be a real test of the leadership of, uh, of the senior players and, and the coaching staff to be able to, I suppose, get that self-belief back quickly. Yeah, it's a back to the wall job, Murray. And traditionally, I suppose that's when we're at our most dangerous, <clears throat> excuse me, going into cliche territory. But maybe it's actually the easiest type of game to get up for and, and to mentally prepare for. Yeah, I think retaining that belief is the key challenge this week. Obviously, there's clear things they have to fix there, but just having that sense, like they'll be talking about this as an unbelievably close game. It obviously was on the, on the scoreboard. And as I said, if they got one of those chances before halftime, just after halftime, there was a try disallowed for Amy Lee Murphy Crow for a very small knock on just at the base of the ruck in what was otherwise an excellent move from them. They've got to look at Baven Parsons' try, a brilliant bit of play that shows what they are capable of. That was one of their cleanest lineouts of the day. Maloney hits McDermott kind of double tops, a really good lift. You have Dorothy Walsh shearing off the mall and, and linking to Sene Nupu midfield for that carry. And then a really nice pass from Stacey Vaud, who I actually think has done really well at 10. I, I think there's major further potential there. She passes really well. She can kick well. She's got a running threat herself. Um, she throws that really nice cutout pass as Emer Constantine runs that excellent line on her left-hand side. And, and Parsons gets a one-on-one. -on -one and, and we saw what she can do with a one-on-one. -on -one. She absolutely rinses the Spanish fullback. Um, and you even have Murphy Crow on the inside there offering support. That was a really clinical, accurate, effective, skillful couple of phases um, and shows what they can do. That's what they need to focus on bringing and believing that they can bring that style of play and just being much more clinical because they got so many opportunities. They put themselves into good positions with a bit of pressure on Spain and, and their kind of errors allowing them in. And they've had the, the wins over Italy the last couple of occasions. That is the, the fear, I suppose, is that the sense of stress that set in in the, in the final quarter against Spain carries over with it maybe a shaky start or whatever that might be but yeah it's a challenge steady yourselves mentally and, and Ireland have enough quality they're absolutely more skillful they're absolutely better at line out breakdown their discipline can be much much improved so there's enough there to, to win and, and, and get it back on track Bert, what are you not seeing in Stacey Flood that Murray does no, see? Sorry, I, 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 um, it wasn't about her. I think she has the potential for sure, but my, my problem is that we haven't settled on 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 her um, enough over the last over the last year, uh, year and a half. That's my, sorry, that's my issue. I think she has the potential. I, I, um, what I meant was um, we haven't probably given her enough game time or trust that she's become the complete 10 yet. Um, and that's, that's my worry. Uh, it, it's more about her being settled in that in that position or if, if anything happened to her that we had a, a ready-made backup so um no I, I do agree with murray I, I think she has potential i think she will be if if we stick with it um but you know i would like to have seen you know a bit more um consistency or or development of that so that you know for, for a must-win game um she she probably was 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 uh, more ready more prepared I think it's a big ask for it to go, if this yeah, game goes into the, if, if this game goes into the the final ten minutes, um, you know, and you need that game management side of it. I, I just think that she probably hasn't had enough game as much game time as she uh, would have been preferable. Yeah, it has jumped all over the place in terms of the out half because obviously Hannah Tyrrell was there more recently. She's retired now, so close to the World Cup, which is interesting in itself. But obviously, a very talented sports person and, and back playing football. Um, and Flood hasn't had a lot of time in 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 the seat at, at ten, but 
it's a pity she had cramped the last day they had to take her off early and, and didn't get a chance to be in that stressful position that's massive in terms of learning as an out half but all the skills there what about that 50 22 kick in the first half where she kind of banana kicked it into touch brilliant bit of skill i thought some of the passing was was class as well so yeah there's there's much better there from Ireland. That's just one exa- example of of player who has loads of ability. Mention Parsons and Murphy Crow. Like get them on the ball. They're two of the most dangerous players in women's rugby. Honestly, they're so hard to put on the ground. So powerful. So elusive. Um, and the pack, they're capable of much, much better. So hopefully, that we we see that on Sunday. Will they get the job done, Bernard? Yeah, I think they will. I think Italy. Um, Italy are prone to errors, and and uh, I just think Scotland, Scotland are so bad. Um, they were flattered by that. I think to be, they'll be Ireland are good enough to be to beat Italy again and, and qualify. <clears throat> Murray, oh, yeah, I'm used to some predictions. It's going to be. I think Spain, Italy, and Ireland are really similar in terms of their their quality. Obviously, they're seven, eight, nine in the rankings as well. And in fairness, sorry, I'm, I know I'm digressing here, but we should give a, sh- a shout for Spain. How they're not on the Six Nations or make it a Seven Nations is baffling. Like they beat Italy at the last World Cup in 2017. They beat Scotland last, just last year. They beat Ireland now. Get them involved. You, you want to grow the game. That's one way of doing it. Give them constant um, high level competition. Ireland going to do it. Uh, looking back at last night, I think that's absolutely a game they should have won against Spain. They were in the right positions. Their field, there was more than enough there to win the game. And if they got that score, they would have, would have driven on. So, yeah, I think Ireland to edge it. But I th- really do think it's going to be in the balance all the way to the end. One or two point margin. But we'll say Ireland. <laughs> Thanks be to God you didn't send us home on a dour note. But that is all we've time for this week. Thanks a million to everybody at home for tuning in. Welcome back, in a way. Uh, members.the42.ie if you sign up there for a fiver a month or 42 euro for the year you get access to all of our extra podcasts and we do appreciate your support we will be back this time next week looking ahead to the inaugural URC season so until then mind yourselves best of luck to Ireland over the weekend take it easy <laughs>